Again, good evening, and as mentioned, with the Lord's help tonight, I'd like to look at the sanctity of life, what the Bible says about life, the sacredness of life, as we find it in the scriptures. And um, before we begin with the subject at hand, I think it's valuable to begin with some notes on some, some foundation that, that we base our discussion on tonight, or we could say presentation or this Bible study. And these are foundational beliefs about the Bible. The Holy Bible is inspired, infallible, authoritative, inerrant. I'll explain those briefly. Um, the Word of God is inspired, which means it's God-breathed. It's, it's, it means that the written Word of God is authoritative and infallible, which I'll explain what those mean too. But as authoritative and infallible as His oral pronunciations. As if God was speaking to us physically today, and He gives us a command, His Word is just as authoritative and infallible. Infallible means it's perfect, uh, because God is perfect. God is flawless. That's infallible. It's without, it's incapable of error. God is perfect. He cannot be wrong. He is uh, without error. He is unfailing. He is true. Something that's infallible is never wrong. Therefore, it's absolutely reliable. So when we consider the subject, What does the Bible say about life as opposed to our culture or other, quote, authorities? Um, What does the Bible say? Well, we can rely on it because it is infallible. It's trustworthy. It's, It's authoritative on all matters or questions regarding faith, meaning doctrine, and also conduct. It's authoritative. It, it, it is the authority. It's the highest authority. In fact, I would probably go as far as to say it's the only authoritative source the Bible is for all matters of faith, doctrine, and Christian living. So it's the Bible, God and the Bible are the only authority. All other authorities come from God. And as such... For instance, church leaders, uh, the the church as a whole, the body of believers, but church leaders, pastors, parents, um, employers, government has, there's authority in, in those, but that authority is delegated from God and from his word. So God and his word are the highest authority. Not church leaders, if they church leaders like the Pope decides to redefine something that is very clear in Scripture and to say that suddenly is okay, like just in the last week and a half or so came out and, and de- declared that homosexuality is okay. Um, just because a, a, a person in authority declares something, it is not so. Just because the culture declares something, it is not so. It is God's word is our authority. It gives directives or orders concerning how to worship, how, how to be worshipped, how to serve him. It is all sufficient to instruct us to righteousness. Um, we don't need another book besides the Bible to make it to heaven, like the Book of Mormon right? We don't need any other book. The Bible, it's sufficient in its, in, in its totality. Uh, it's inerrant. There's no errors. It makes no false or misleading statements. So it says what it means and means what it says. So even though the subject we're considering tonight, if you discuss, if you don't start on this foundation on the, that the Bible is the absolute truth, then you can't build 
a position or argument that, that, that stands if you don't have a foundation, and the Bible is our foundation, our authority. Jesus validated the, both the Old Testament, and, and he spoke. Uh, the, the apostles in the early church quoted from the Old Testament and also the New Testament writings. They also uh, treated them and gave them the same uh, divine authority. But the early church honored both the New Testament and the Old Testament as authoritative or as being inspired and infallible. So the Word of God is our authority. We could talk more about and do a whole set of studies on the Bible, but we will con- con- continue. But that's our foundation. It is the Bible that is our authority. Tonight's objectives. Like to look with the Lord's help at what does the Bible say about human life? What does the Bible say about abortion? Uh, what does the Bible say about embryonic stem cell research, about suicide, around, about euthanasia, and, and physician-assisted suicide. The Bible warns us that we live in, uh, the end times will be perilous times, dangerous times, grievous times, tragic times. Um, the escalating number of abortions, which we'll look at uh, annually, the widespread promotion of embryonic stem cell research. Actually, California is again voting on this. When we were in California, we had to vote on it. They're voting for funding, to, for state funding to support embryonic uh, um, stem cell research. We need to understand how does that play in what the Bible says about life. Uh, the determination to legalize um, and legitimize euthanasia, and even um, physician-assisted suicides that's being more and more accepted uh, doesn't make it right. So while the Bible may not specifically address these by name, it does uh, address them through principle and through various scriptures we will look at, and um, that's what we will look at tonight is how does the Bible address these subjects? Human life is sacred. According to God's word, every human life, every human life, from conception through death, is to be valued, respected, and protected. Um, God created life, and we'll look at first couple verses here, Genesis 2, 7, and I have these on your hand now. You could uh, make notes if you want or just refer to them, uh, but as we go, notice, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God created life. He formed man, and he, he is the life giver. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And I included this verse because all things, there are, there are other scriptures that speak about our purpose, why we have been created. But here's one that tells us all things were created by him and for him. That tells us that we have a purpose. We have been created with a purpose. We're not random stardust, okay? We are not, we have not uh, just randomly evolved from bacteria. There is a purpose to our life but to every life that is conceived. That's what the Bible tells us. Um, Human life or respect for human life starts by acknowledging God as the creator and the life giver. So we shouldn't be surprised whether it's an individual or a, a nation or a world that denies God. By extension, that individual or nation will also abandon respect for life 
uh, of each human being. So God created all human life. He is the life giver. God created man in his own image. Genesis 1, 27. Read it with me just so I don't do all the talking. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. As beautiful as and as colorful and as uh, the variety that we see in, our, in, in, the, in the plant life and animal life, none of it compares to human life. God made man in his own image. And this is significant um, because human life is the most precious. Of all life, human life is the most precious to God. Note in this verse that male and female were both made in God's image. We both, male and female, resemble the characteristics of our Heavenly Father. And when the Bible speaks of being created in His image, we are created in His image as far as moral beings, spiritual beings, We're eternal beings like God. We have a body that is temporary, but our soul is eternal. Some say, and it's accurate to say, we we are a soul, we have a body. Body is temporary, but our soul is who we are and who we will exist eternally. Just like God, we are eternal. We're rational beings, volitional. We can make choices. We're relational, like God is, and we are powerful. We have been given dominion over all the rest of creation. We're not as powerful as God, obviously, but, but that dominion that God has given us is because we have been created in God's image. That's significant as we consider life. God values life because we are created in his image. We are his children, Every person born in this world has been personally created by God. Not just Adam and Eve. Did you know that? Look at these scriptures. The Isaiah 44, 2. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb. Job 10 8, thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, or all together. So notice, Job says, Your hands, thy hands have made me, made me and fashioned me together. David in Psalm 139, and we will look more closely at this uh, psalm later, for thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. The word possessed here means created or formed. So my reins, thou hast created my internal organs or my, my uh, uh, thou hast formed my internal or- organs. The same word as possessed uh, in, in Genesis 14, 22, Abraham says to the king of Sodom, I have I have lift up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. So the possessor is the creator. So when David says, for thou hast possessed my reins, he's saying thou hast created my reins or my internal organs. Thou hast covered. That word cover there means woven or knitted or interweaved. You've interweaved me with bones and nerves and muscles and vascular ducts, if you will. That's what he's saying. You, you possess my, for thou hast possessed my, uh, created my reins and has woven me in my mother's womb. I mean, we're so complex. Uh, the human body is made in such a complex manner. And God wove it all, interwoven it all together just perfectly. So he's involved in the creation of every baby, every fetus, 
every human life, uh, every embryo. God is involved in the development. He oversees the development of every life. God values human life. David um, says in Psalm 8, 3, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thine hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So David's comparing all creation to human life. And uh, he feels so unworthy that God would be so concerned with human beings, with, it, with him, but with all of us. God is very much concerned with every individual, human individual. Matthew 10, 29 through 31, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very, fa- very hairs of your head are all numbered, Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. If God is concerned about one sparrow, why, how much more he's concerned about, he values life. Does our society value life? Some. It's a loaded question. What does the Bible say about human life? God protects human life. Exodus 20, 13 says, Thou shalt not kill, which speaks of murder. Thou shalt not murder. Uh, Jesus confirmed that when he's rehearsing the law. In Matthew 19, 18, he says, Jesus said, Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt do no murder. Murder is the unlawful, premeditated killing of a, another human being. Um, the life of a human being is so precious to God and so unique that he pronounces eternal punishment for those that take a life. Okay? Now, thou shalt do no murder is different. This does not include or forbid self-defense or does not forbid the court system from putting offenders to death. In fact, in Romans we read that the government bears not the sword in vain. The government has a sword or other um, weapons to enforce the law, and it bears not the sword in vain. So the, God gives the government the authority to execute um, capital punishment. So, but the, but the Bible does forbid all malice and all hatred. Actually, this one's, I don't know if I, uh, Genesis 9, 5, and 6, I don't think it's on our screen, but the reason God protects life is given in Genesis 9, 5, and 6. At the hand of every man's brother, notice this. He says, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. So there's the civil law and the moral law. And the Jew, Jews had the, the civil law pro, provided the, the, the laws for society to get along, to function properly. And the civil law allowed for an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. So here he says, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. And he says, why? He says, for in the image of God made he man. Why is God so concerned to protect human life? Again, like I said, it's because we are made in God's image. God loves all of us. We're all his children as, as human beings. God has sovereign authority over life. Ecclesiastes 8.8, 8, there's no man, no man, okay? No government either that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. No man hath ability or authority over his own spirit. If we could control when we die, 
And when, when death is near, you know, people would say, hey, I, I don't want to go yet. <laughs> and, but we can't stop. It is appointed to man to die, and wants for man to die, and then the judgment. So there, we, but we do not have authority over our spirit to decide when we go or when we stay. God is the giver of life, and he has authority over us. So now, abortion. The practice of abortion is an evil that has claimed millions of lives, millions of innocent babies. So this is as of today at 5.03, if you could read that. Since 1973, 62 million, 340, 861 innocent babies were murdered in the U.S. alone. Just today, as of 5 o'clock or 5.03, 1,678 babies were aborted just today. More by now. And in the world, worldwide since 1980, 1 billion, 593 million. It seems that abortion is, at least in part, the world's solution to cover up sin. Some view pregnancy as an inconvenience, and I know it's not, uh, it's not an easy thing for a woman to go through, but life is a gift from God. Um, Ronald Reagan said, I've noticed that everybody that is for abortion has already been born. The term pro-choice, I don't really like it. (laughs) It is a sanitized term that advocates for gruesome horrific taking of the life of, of an innocent baby. I rather, <laughs> when I, I'm not saying it's wrong for somebody to say pro-choice, but I, as much as I can, I try to say pro-abortion. Because pro-choice sanitizes. Even pro-abortion is not as um, descriptive as to say pro-murder or pro-killing, and I know that could, some view it offensively, but abortion is very offensive. Uh, it's offensive to God. Proverbs 6, 16, and 17 states that God hates hands that shed innocent blood. Does it get any more innocent than a baby in a womb? Exodus 21, 22, and 23. If men strive, meaning fight, they're violent, and they hurt a woman with a child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, no death occurs, may, mother or baby does not, does not die, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine and if any mischief or death follow then thou shalt give life for life God ordain that those who cause death of an adult of a mother or of a baby would be subject to death Com- Killing a baby in the womb was similar as committing murder of a, an a adult human being, of a mother. Um, when, of course, the idea, the advocates for the, that term pro-choice, they're arguing for, for the choice of the mother, but what about the daughter that's in, in the womb? Does she have a choice? Again, our authority is the Bible, God's Word, the giver of life. 
not our culture. Every life is valuable to God. Sometimes they say, what about special cases? And I'm not talking about um, if the mother's in danger, in danger and then even those, they're, they're, those are very rare. The idea of, of saving life is what we're concerned with, not taking life. But the, sometimes you may hear, you know, what about when a life is conceived by something as horrible as rape? Does it still matter to God? A life that is conceived in fornication or adultery is conceived in sin, and it still matters to God. We have a little video. It's about a minute, and we'll let Brother Foreign play that. Years ago, a young 15-year-old girl became pregnant. She had a lot of difficult choices to make, maybe more so than some teen girls because she was raped. But this young girl chose to give her child life and then to place that child with an adoptive family. And that child was me. My biological father is a rapist. I don't even know my ethnicity. But I am still a human being and I still have value. And my life isn't worth less than yours just because of the way I was conceived. And I don't believe that I deserve the death penalty because of the crime of my biological father. I've never met my birth mom. Someday I hope to. And if I get that chance, I'm going to wrap my arms around her and I'm going to tell her I love her. Because she loved me. Loved me enough to give me my life and then to give me my amazing family. I'm the oldest of eight children. Seven of us adopted every color of the rainbow in my family. And I know that those two gifts were a gift from a very scared 15-year-old girl. God has a definite plan and purpose for each individual, every human life, even those that never make it out of the womb. God has a plan. Jeremiah 1, 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. Just like God had a plan for Jeremiah, God has a plan for every life, no matter how they were conceived. What would this world be like with those that, you know, we even sometimes have people taken from us too quickly, too soon, that get to live for a while, and then they're murdered. And we wonder what would they have, what would life would have been like for them and for us if they were still around. Well, God had a plan and has a plan for every life. Life begins, the Bible tells us, at conception. David wrote, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity in Psalm 51, 5, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So notice David sees that he was, a, he was sinful even at the time he was conceived. If, if he was not a person, if he was not a person, then he could not have a sinful nature at that time. A pre-human uh, mass of cells does not have a moral nature. You know, that's what they like to tell you, that a fetus or an embryo is not human, Right? Uh, take the human out of it. It's not a person, but a, like a tumor. A tumor that has no moral qualities. But David says when he was con- conceived at conception, he had a moral nature. Um, only the humanness, only our humanity at the time of conception would allow David to be possessed with a sinful nature. Um, Psalm 139, we read briefly the first verse, but here let's look at this more. Psalm 139, verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, again, created or formed my internal organs, thou hast covered covered me in my mother's womb. We remember that means you've woven or interweaved me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Now, 
The next two verses use the word substance, but the original Hebrew, they're two different words. So first he says, my substance was not hid from thee. The word substance there, the Hebrew word is otsem, which means strength or bones or frame. So he says, my substance or my bones were not hid from thee when I was made in secret and, in, and curiously wrought or skillfully fashioned. When I was made in secret in that place where man cannot see until more and recently where through um, ultrasound or other means you can, now we can actually see through ultrasound, the baby in the womb, but God was able to see in the womb before there was ultrasound. So David says, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That speaks of the womb again. Um, God knew David, the person, the human being. God knew David the person before he was formed. The personal pronouns pronouns that he uses, my reins, my mother's womb, my substance, I was made in secret, shows that the Bible recognizes the embryo or, or, or the fetus and the fetus as a person. Then, so in verse 15, we see the word substance, but then again in verse 16, we see, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. So that whole... Um, my substance, yet yeah, being unperfect. Those words actually come from one Hebrew word, and that word is golem, which denotes a rolled up, something that's rolled up as a ball or unformed mass, undeveloped mass or substance. In other words, human embryo. So he says, thine eyes did see my embryo, in other words, in thy book or in thy scroll. All my members were written, so in in thy book, all my members were written or prescribed, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. There's a scroll or a book. Many that study the, the, the Bible and look at the scriptures believe and I do too, this refers to DNA. So there's a scroll or a book, and God wrote, all the members were written, prescribed, uh, and which in continuance or a specific or special period of time and sequence were fashioned or formed according to that plan. Did you know that the DNA has all the instructions for, uh, from the first cell of co- conception, not only the characteristics of your eye color, your, your um, various characteristics, but also the instructions how to make that human being are written in that book or in that DNA. Um, a paraphrase for verse 16 is, Your eyes looked upon my embryo, and everything was recorded in your book. The day schedule for my formation were inscribed, even though none of them had come yet. And then David says, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. And if you read through, read through the whole Psalm 139, we, we read through part of it yesterday, and it reminds us of how much God thinks about us and how aware he is of, of everything about us and where we are at all times. And it's precious. Life is precious. Is the Bible clear that God is for life, <laughs> values life, protects life? As believers, as Christians, um, the Bible declares categorically it is there's no exception God values every life so we vote we support measures that support 
what the Bible teaches. Um, we're going to look at, briefly, embryonic stem cell research. Embryologists agree that from the moment of con conception, all 46 chromosomes and a fully functioning unique genetic code are present. At conception, a unique human DNA is formed that has never existed before, nor ever be repeated again. At conception, all physical characteristics, gender, hair color, eye color, are already determined from that first cell at conception. Size and location of the embryo does not determine humanity. Embryonic cells, oh, stem cells, are taken from human embryos, and because research on embryonic stem cells required the destruction of a living human being, um, we, with biblical principles in mind, uh, don't support embryonic stem cell research. There's no possible future benefit uh, to society justifies killing a, an, another life. These subjects are heavier than I'm... I'm trying to be true to Scripture, but we could be more graphic and we could be more harsh and we could be more um, dogmatic, but I think that the Scripture speaks for itself of how, um, how much God values life and wants us to protect it, and He has authority over it. And these subjects are all sensitive. They are. And we deal with these. I have, as a pastor, looking at suicide have been touched, uh, not personally, but as a pastor, I've had to deal with them multiple times. And, and it's heartbreaking. And suicide is free and uncoerced actions engaged in for the purpose of bringing about one's own death. Giving your own life for your country or family or others is not suicide. A soldier that jumps on an exploding device in order to save his fellow soldiers is not committing suicide. Just like the actions of, of Samson. Samson did not con uh, commit suicide. Uh, his actions were taken to save the others from the Philistines in obedience to God. But um, as far as taking one's own life, the Bible forbids it. We're careful as to, when, when you hear the news that perhaps somebody did, sometimes there may be a little bit of hope if they may be attempted to and maybe they didn't pass away right away. And if their cognitive abilities are still there, perhaps they regretted doing it, and then they repent before they pass, perhaps. Or that's very risky. I, just something we, we don't want to ever be confused about. Suicide is self-murder. And, um, but we're sensitive when, when loved ones, uh, of people we know committed suicide, you know, we're sensitive because we want to show love to them and encourage them and God is love and once we want to comfort them and let um, God help them through the pain that they're going through. But the Bible is clear. No life can be taken by another individual, even ourselves. Euthanasia. 
Synonyms are mercy killing. The euthanasia is the painless killing of a patient suffering from an incurable and painful disease. Um, it's actually a practice that's illegal in most countries. Physician-assisted suicide is when the doctor assists the patient by prescribing drugs or giving them instructions on how to do themselves. And again, while society, parts of society advocate for it being an, um, uh, an appropriate thing to help somebody that's dealing with suffering, we know that God allows suffering and there's a purpose for suffering, but ultimately God is uh, the authority over our lives. Job said, I know that thou will bring me to death and to the house or the place appointed for all living. God has sovereign authority as the creator and, and over our lives, and he decides how a person's death will occur. Um, we looked at Ecclesiastes 8.8 8 earlier, but there's no man that hath power or authority over the spirit that retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. God has the final say. So euthanasia or suicide or, uh, or physician-assisted suicide are man's ways of trying to serve the authority of God. And as mentioned, God has a purpose for our lives, even in suffering, when somebody's suffering, um, God often works things out during that suffering for us or those around us, so it's not justifiable ever to take somebody else's life. Throughout the history of humanity, there's been a lot of violence committed against other human beings. Um, horrible. And even the, when we read through the Old Testament, we see the uh, Canaanites that were spewed out of the land, their, their gross idolatry, and we read of their sacrificing their children unto idols, and we look at that and think, how could they? You know, but this is no different today. Abortion is sacrificing babies to self. Self is the idol. And um, we're reminded that God values, protects life. He is the giver of life. He has authority over life. Um, just because something is legal doesn't make it right. We know that. And uh, tonight, thank you for your attention. We have an opportunity to pray and to say thank you to the giver of life for the life that he's given us and the plans and purposes he has for our lives. And one of the scriptures, we didn't read it, but one of the scriptures tells us that we're created for his glory for his pleasure and for his glory. We are created to bring glory to God. And every life it was created with that purpose. So thank God today for Jesus who died to redeem humanity and, and bring forgiveness for those that have uh, committed horrible crimes. God still loves them and forgives if they will just turn from their sins and turn to the Savior. Out of the greatest tragedy, which was the cross, came the greatest uh, triumph, which is life, eternal life. So that's what we have. We have Jesus to celebrate and to thank God for his word and the authority that we have to stand on.